Hi, this is Tom Rischer, uh, Inside Cardiology Edition from a very hot summer. And in a hot summer, we talk about fluid, fluid uh, re uh, substitution and so forth. And in this context also, salt is a very important topic. So how much salt in the soup should we ingest? That's the question we will answer uh, today. But first, uh, let's look back uh, why we actually use salt. In fact, it only started like three, four thousand years ago when uh, the Romans in particular and the Mediterranean area uh, uh, manufactured salt out of seawater and then distributed it uh, and exported it to Asia, Arabia and so forth. So why was salt suddenly so important? <clears throat> Because obviously at that time there were no uh, refrigerators, so preservation of food was a major issue. And it was discovered that uh, salt and salty solutions uh, lend themselves very well for fruit preservation. Furthermore, uh, they discovered that they can disinfect wounds with it. And finally, it improved taste of any nutrient. So it was very popular and in fact, uh, to show that further, the Roman legionaries were received as part of their soldiers' pay uh, a portion of salt, the so-called salarium from Latin sol for salt. So this led to expression of salary initially for the officers of the Roman army, but then also the soldiers and eventually until today for everybody. So this is the story of salt. Now salt is good and bad. In fact, we have it in the cells and the, of our body and without it we would not function. But maybe there is too much salt when we uh, use it to preserve our food and to use it during dinner and uh, any uh, um, ingestion of food. So it was discovered that there is a relation with blood pressure but it wasn't so straight. And this is from the Seminal Art and Guidance uh, textbook where it showed when you measure urinary sodium excretion versus mean arterial blood pressure, you can have a very steep uh, curve where uh, by with increasing uh, uh, ingestion of sodium and of course the sodium excretion is a surrogate for that, there's very little change in blood pressure and th these are the salt resistant individuals. But in some there is a flatter curve and with steady increases in sodium intake, the blood pressure increases as well. And of course, this is genetic in nature mainly. And there have a lot of genes been discovered to be involved in that, like alpha adductine, angiotensinogen, cytochrome P450A3, uh, G protein, beta 3 subunit uh, mutations, aldosterone synthase, uh, mutations, ACE uh, angiotensin converting enzyme mutations and also mutations in the alpha, in the 11 beta hydroxy uh, dehydrogenase 2. So <clears throat> how does this relate though to cardiovascular outcomes? And it is interesting that this is a, a U-shaped curve or a J-curve if you wish. And what the sweet spot is, is around 4 to 5 grams per day of sodium excretion, which reflects what we ingest. And you can see that if we move higher up, of course, the hazard ratio for mortality, stroke, MI and hospitalizations for heart failure increases steadily uh, from a hazard ratio of 1 to 1 of about 1.8 uh, uh, in the maximum for those who eat a lot of salt. Now, uh, when we go lower, contrary to other Z-loads that uh, rec uh, recommended very severe uh, sodium restriction, there may actually be an increase in the hazard ratio of uh, maize. So this has to be taken into account. When then we look at uh, cardiovascular deaths, we see the very same phenomenon. There is a sweet spot at four to five grams per day and if you go lower or higher you increase uh, cardiovascular mortality by a factor of up to 1.8. Congestive heart failure same thing and here we will come back to that that if you go lower 
with a very severe sodium restriction in heart failure that some do recommend we may actually do harm. And then also stroke uh, is the same situation. The sweet spot is around four to five, uh, but here stroke has an exception else there is no increase in uh, the hazard ratio of experience uh, such an event when you go lower with sodium intake. Uh, this also applies for myocardial infarction, where there's a steady increase as we go uh, above 1.5 uh, grams per, uh, of sodium per day. Now, what about uh, heart failure here? Water and sodium retention is very, very important and also feared by the patient and the doctor. And so here the question comes up, should we really be very, very strict with sodium uh, uh, restriction? But in fact, it shows in this meta-analysis, uh, normal sodium diet is favored compared to a very low sodium diet by, by a considerable factor. And so severe restriction of sodium is most likely unfavorable in patients with heart failure. So what uh, should we say to a patient? Because grams per day, who knows what that really means. And here uh, I would suggest uh, that if we go for 4.6 gram per day as an optimal sweet spot value, then we would say uh, at most two uh, teaspoons of salt per day would be optimal. So should we salt when we eat? And you uh, all experience that there are people before they actually uh, taste any food, they put salt on it, others don't use salt at all. So what is it and what does it matter? And here there's a recent paper just came out in the European Heart Journal, adding salt to foods and hazard of premature mortality out of uh, uh, the uh, UK uh, registry uh, by uh, these authors here. And what they found is first of all, that when you, uh, uh, you, you create groups of uh, those who never or rarely uh, use uh, salt, uh, additional salt when they eat, to those who do it is sometimes, usually, or even always. And you can see in the red triangles that there is a steady increase uh, in uh, uh, the sodium uh, excretion in uh, urine and therefore the ingestion as a reflection of the ingestion of salt and there's a decrease in potassium which is actually protective as we will see in a second and of course uh, you can see that the estimated 24-hour sodium excretion based on that really uh, correlates very very nicely so in the UK biobank they actually looked at some interesting aspects of that first of all if you have a low intake <clears throat> of fruits and vegetables which of course affects your potassium intake. You can see when you always have a low intake of total fruits, your hazard ratio for mace is 1.7 roughly, when it's usually it's a bit less, sometimes a bit less, but all of them, if they don't eat a lot of fruits, but salt a lot uh, on their food, they don't do very well. On the other hand, you can see <clears throat> that also potassium is inversely related to this behavior. So if you don't eat fruits at all and you always use your salt uh, uh, dispenser uh, when you eat, uh, there is an increase uh, in the hazard ratio of mace of around 1.7 as well. And uh, this declines uh, uh, for usually, sometimes and never rarely a use of the salt dispenser. So. This study really shows that the frequency of adding salt to foods can be measured with a very simple uh, questionnaire to the patient. Are you using salt when you eat all the time, sometimes, or rarely, or never? And they uh, looked at this in participants of the UK Biobank and more than 500,000 individuals with a medium of nine-year follow-up and they showed a graded relationship between higher frequency of adding salt to foods and higher concentrations of spot urinary sodium or estimated 24-hour sodium excretion uh, in uh, the urine. And then if, when we look at outcome on the right of the slide, you can see that there's a higher 
hazard for premature mortality compared to the never rarely group always adding salt to foods was related with a 20% higher hazard for premature mortality and high intake of vegetable and fruits may attenuate uh, the adverse association of high sodium intake with mortality so this has to be really taken into account and so how much salt in the soup we can say uh, as we end up uh, and round up this uh, slides no processed dishes do not add salt to food because it's unnatural anyway and increase potassium intake by fruits and vegetables so thank you very much for your attention see you soon